Brian Walker joins us. Brian needs no introduction, but 1980, uh, the, the, the last, he doesn't like to say this because he wishes <laughs> there was a Final Four in between, but last point guard on a Purdue Final Four, four team, uh, and obviously one of the greats, Purdue's all-time greats in assist uh, and this point guard play. Brian, a native of Lebanon, Indiana, and we'll talk some little Rick Mount uh, stories too, as he has far more of them probably than I do, but uh, welcome to the show, and uh, it's good Thank to you, have Alan. you here. Good to be back. And Brian joins us every year because I love, Brian's, our best conversations are in the hallway at Mackey Arena typically, <laughs> which we only get to do that about once or twice a year. But it's all, I always find him very instructive just in terms of his perspective of, of playing. So, and his, he's coached a lot also on, uh, after his playing days. But, Brian, uh, all right, you lose a game at Maryland. And, and as a player, you got to put that back. You guys lost at Northwestern, I think, and on en route to the Final Four uh, team that uh, turned around. So, as a player, what do you do mentally when you, when you shoot 16% in the second half and basically lay an egg? <laughs> in a nice way, but just didn't get the job done. Well, the season's like a marathon. So one game is not uh, retrospective what your team is and who they are. So they got to get back to basics. Um, they laid an egg. They shot some of their shots. Most of their shots in the second half were contested. It felt like that a lot of the, the shots were just in and out. I mean, there was yeah. one shot from the baseline. Can't remember it was Grady that shot it. That, I mean, I thought it was in, and yeah. it somehow it looked like someone tipped it up from underneath. It was just one of those nights where the, the lid's been closed, and um, you go back and you work on your jump shots and, and not worry about it. I mean, you really go back to it. I, I thought maybe in that game they should have got more touches inside. When you're not shooting – a quality team that's going to get to the Final Four is a team that when your outside shooting isn't working, you find other ways, mm -hmm. as Coach Penny would say. You either get offensive rebounds and putbacks for the little ones, or you take it inside and try a different avenue of scoring, or you up your tempo on defense, you get more steals, something like this. you got to make up for because you're not going to shoot you know, 40% from the three-point line every game. Yeah. Uh, when you do, like we did in the first half, well, we four for six yeah, in the yeah. first half, you look pretty good, yeah. and we did look good. What well, we were up eight at half, yeah. but when the when the lid gets closed, you got to find other ways to win, and we just didn't do that that last week. Yeah, sort of critique Carson Edwards' play. I mean, obviously he's the straw that stirs the drink in West Lafayette. Um, I've been watching Purdue basketball a long time. I've not seen many shooters um, of his ilk. Just sort of give us your analysis of maybe Carson Edwards so far this year. Well, um, Carson is probably w would be a, a, a difficult player to coach because, you know, it, there's an old saying about a thoroughbred, you can't put a rein on a thoroughbred. You know, so you've got to let Carson go and do his thing. The question is at what point when it, his thing isn't working as a coach do you pull the plug? And what I mean by that is because his next shot might be his next five in a row. So it's, it's dangerous thing, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. frustrating. Yeah. So to me, um, you know, the, the things that Carson, in my opinion, could do is when he's having an off-shooting night or an off-shooting five-minute segment, whatever you want to say, is play defense. He should be our best defensive player. I mean, you know, it, he is a little bow-legged, so he's already in that defensive yeah. stance yeah, that right. most of us can't get into, and he's quick, and he's, got, he's athletic. So when I see him struggling offensively, I also see him struggling defensively, and that's something that can take him to the next level in the NBA. He can't do that at the next level. He's, for, for, for two to get better, and if I was talking to Carson today, I would say, look, when you shoot three or four in the row, you've gonna, you're gonna, you're got the green light, but on the other end, play defense. When you want to play defense, he does, and he gets steals and breakaway shots. But there's other times where he makes a half-hearted effort on the defensive end. That's where my critique of him would be. And, you know, uh, Rick Mount might say, well, I didn't want to wear my offensive legs out <laughs> playing defense. He would have said that. <laughs> um, but that's different, and, and it is. Yeah. And, 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 and Carson's a lot more athletic now than what the players were in my generation mm -hmm. or in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. You know, you look also at the inside-outside game of this it, – I, I think this team is better when, you know, Trayvon Williams needs to learn how not to, get to, you know, needs to learn a little more about officiating or how the game's going to be called. He's got to stay on the court. Have you seen that also as well, that if they, if they can do some things inside and actually feed the post some, uh, we're not going to feed, you're not going to feed it as much as you did obviously last year with Isaac Haas and et cetera, and what, what we've been used to over the last past few years. But uh, correlation there, how do you look at that? 
I think Travion Williams um, obviously is, is a good score inside. Um, I don't know that teams are, you know, they might even try to double team him now. I mean, I think he's that good a player. Next year you'll see teams double teaming when the ball goes into the post. Um, this year, he, you know, he's kind of a, a blossom flower, and he's starting to bloom. He's not full bloom yet, no, but he can still score. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's part of the problem. Yes, uh, against Ohio State, he got in foul trouble. Yeah. But when you have a threat like that, and quite frankly, Harms can shoot that ten foot baseline jumper. And Harms, if he catches the, it's all about for big guys is catching the ball in the right place yeah, on the court. Work, yeah. And uh, <laughs> when they can't, so I, what I like about Trevion that Isaac couldn't necessarily do is, is Travion doesn't catch it in the right place, but it's usually on the right block if you're looking away from the basket. He can dribble and get yeah. to his position where he can use his big yeah. body and get the shot. Isaac tried, but he <laughs> wasn't as good as, yeah. as what Travion is as a freshman. So I like that, but I would just wish they would maybe use Travion a little bit more and, and take the ball into him when we're throwing the ball around the perimeter. Yeah. That's what I would like to see. Yeah. Hey, biggest strength, biggest weakness for this team? The biggest strength is probably their three-point shooting, which is also, as we found out in the second half of Ohio State, their biggest weakness. It's yeah, the live and die by the <laughs> sword, right, by the three-pointer. Um, uh, what I like about the team is we got nine or ten players that – who are you going to try and stop? You're obviously going to try and hold Carson to his points, or like some of the coaches say, let him get his points but make it on Lots of 25 shots, shots yeah, rather yeah, than 15. Yeah, no doubt. But then there's other players. <clears throat> you know, who's, you know what, I, what this team has that other teams don't is you've got – eight, nine other players that can contribute on any given night. Harms might, you know, gets a double-double, or Trevion scores 10 or 12 points. At that center position, if you add to yeah. the players are there, we're averaging a double-double, yeah. I believe, from those guys. So that that's that's nice to have, but you don't know if Eifert's going to get 15 points or, or, or five points or, or go down the Wheeler or, or – um, I can't think of the rest of the players on the team, but um, it, that's what I like well, about Stephane, the team. Well, Stefan Stefanovic also yeah, comes in and gets you know, off the comes bench. Off yeah. the bench and Eric Hunter. Eric Hunter. The Hunter. All right, I want to ask you about Eric Hunter because he's an interesting guy yeah. and, and that has a lot of want to. He's young and he, I think, has taken some steps forward. I think he's taken a couple steps back in games. I should say the last couple of games, but but a guy that uh, trying to convert yourself. To, to the point, uh, and you you were always kind of a natural there, but you scored a lot in high school. I mean, that's a tough thing to do. I mean, he's a huge volume scorer uh, 28, 29 points in high school. What's that like mentally to do that and, and, and you know that that's not your job nearly as much as it used to be? Um, I don't know if it's different today than when I yeah. played uh, as far as the mentality would be, do you want to play? Do you want minutes on the floor? Yeah. I wanted minutes on the floor, so I was going to do whatever it would take to get out there on the floor. Um, if you're 29 points a game in high school and you think you're recruited to come in and shoot, and maybe you are your junior, senior year, sophomore year, but yeah. as a freshman, we've got that with, yeah. with Klein and, and uh, Carson. So we don't need that. So yeah. what do we need? And I'd look and say, playing defense, he has really progressed in his defense from the beginning of the yeah. season to now. His offensive game is still about where it was at the beginning yeah. of the game. He hasn't been able to improve upon that, and that's probably frustrating for him. But if he concentrates on what I, I think what Coach Painter wants him to do is, is basically come in as a relief player yeah. and give great minutes on defense, don't commit turnovers. And, uh, and he's I, doing a pretty good yeah, job with that. I yeah. think he's going to be a good player for yeah, Purdue. I do, I do too. You know, i got to know. I've got to know, Brian. Is Purdue going to win the Big Ten? That's the question we all want to have answered. We set fans up. We know the scenarios. Michigan, Michigan State, Purdue, 11 and 3, 11 and 3, 10 and 3. Remain schedule favors the Boilermakers. Penn State, Saturday have, at Indiana. Boilers going to do it, do you think? Um, you didn't know you were going to be put on the spot here. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's good yeah. for you. No, I, I, um, I think they have a chance to – it depends what happens. I mean, Michigan and Michigan State have to play each other. Twice. twice. Right. Yeah. Home Michigan, and home. Michigan's got to play Maryland twice. Yeah. Michigan does? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and I, go to Minnesota. I, I yeah. think you're going to see a lot of movement in the, in the top three teams in the last five, six um, games that are left at the, for the teams. But I think Purdue has a chance to win it and – probably maybe tied with somebody, they might be able to win it outright. To me is what what do they do in the rebound game after the loss at Maryland? How will they play this Saturday? That will tell you the character of what this team's gonna be moving forward in my opinion. Hey, real quick, I, I gotta know, you never want to lose, but is there such a thing as a good loss and was that a good loss for Purdue? 
I believe in good losses. Okay. I'm not saying that was a good loss, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. Does, does it not going to recalibrate them and get them refocused? Um, well, you can you can have games that you win that you can do recalibration and, sure. and yeah. getting them focused. Yeah. So, um, is there such a thing as a good loss? Yeah. So, you know, when you get to dance time, there's never a no. good loss. Yeah. Even, you know, so I would say no. Okay. Not at all. But um, yeah, no. this is this competitive things coming out, right? I got yeah. you. <laughs> no such thing as a good loss. Greatest one of the greatest competitor in Purdue basketball history is Brian Walker. All right, we want to go back now because I, I, we have we could do a whole show on on Lee Rose stories and Gene Cady stories and and uh, but 1980 the Final Four team, just in terms of what it took and, and you guys did not win the Big Ten. Uh, I think you finished third, but uh, I think it was fourth. Yeah, and, and and you had a chance to uh, you know play a couple games at home, but that's just that that thing that that what it takes to the tournament is is different but it's still the same when you get you you had to you have to go through it and you got to get some breaks maybe Kentucky losing to Duke was that break though you played Kentucky tough but what what's that mentality take you know if you're going to sit there and talk to those guys when it comes to tournament times what's the most important thing to do uh, from a mental standpoint when you're when you're in the NCAA tournament in your view I, I think it, it's a mistake to say okay the regular seasons are with now we go to the 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 postseason tournament and the approach should be the same you want to win every game there's no no bad losses yeah. or, or bad Good. wins or yeah. whatever you want to yeah. say I guess there's bad wins so when you get there you want to have the same what, what got you to into the tournament what was it were you feeding the post were you shooting good threes were you running the offense did you play good defense did you do off whatever got you there you have to continue to do it and when you get knocked out of the tournament it's in a game that you go back and look you didn't do what you did that got you there yeah. it may have been if you're averaging six or seven offensive rebounds a game you got zero yeah. or your 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 shooting percentage is forty percent from the threes and you shoot 16. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the things that, and, and that's what opposing coaches look for, yeah. is to take you out of what you're good sure. at. And if Purdue can, sometimes you can take the other team out of what they're good at, and then it offsets what you're not doing well in that game. And then it comes down to a close game and, and hitting your free throws. Competitive-wise, I mean, it's, it's one and you're out. And um, what I like to see sometimes is you've got the senior leadership, but sometimes senior leadership, and I watched a lot of tournament games, you know, the seniors is it's, this is the last time I get to wear this uniform, yeah. and they yeah. sometimes get a little tight. And it's the younger players that they're, they're more relaxed and loose. So you need a good combination like that mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, I like to see that. But, um, you know, I, it seems, and the, Alan helped me out here, but the history of the, of the tournament is players who have good guards. Oh, yeah. The teams that have oh, good yeah. guards seem to go the furthest. And that's what I like about Purdue's team this year is we have an opportunity with the makeup that we have and all the pieces that Painter has put around to, to support them, I think the Boilers have a good shot going deep in the tournament this year. 23 and 10 that year, 11 and 7 in the Big Ten, finished third, Brian. And, you know, every, every team when they make a march to the Final Four has at least one close call. What was your close call? Do you recall during that march? Which should that Final Four be in Marcus Square Arena, just 60 miles from campus? A close call. Um, the, the games we had at Purdue, I don't think were no, that weren't. close. Um, Indiana was not a close call no. because Knight got some technicals at <laughs> halftime that helped us push out. Yeah. They they had they didn't play well that game. And then Duke, I I, I think. Let's call you down at I the think, half. I think there was a close call in Duke. I can't remember what it was. And I think um, was Joe in foul trouble in that yeah, game. Yeah, and Ted Benson. Well, he was against against uh, Indiana too earlier. Yeah. So. Um, I don't remember the close calls per se, but Duke had Mike Gaminski and uh, the big uh, other Gene kid, Banks, Gene ba Eugene Vince Banks. Taylor. They they were a good team, but I just think we had more athleticism probably mm -hmm. than they did. Um, so I, I don't know if I can answer that question. A close call. You got to go back and watch that DVD <laughs> he gave us last year. That was my my most prized possession, except that the Duke game. He gave us the v DVD of the uh, Purdue Indiana and Purdue uh, Duke games on NBC. But the Duke game, at least my copy cuts off with like five minutes to go and I want to know if that's on yours because I want to see I wanted to see the celebration <laughs> when Lee Rose throws the throws his program in the air and and Brian gets to cut down the nets but that is a you know is an unbelievable experience I mean you still you can still that 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 resonates uh, I know you hate to admit we all hate to admit it's 38 years later 39 years <laughs> later but unbelievable experience it was a great experience I 
you know, my memory is not what I thought it used to yeah. be because I, I thought I stole the ball from Isaiah in the second half. It was in the first <laughs> no, half. No, I know. It was I in know. the first half, and I was like, hmm, I thought that was yeah. in the second half. Um, but the, the real, still, my, my, my favorite memory of, of Purdue was I, I think we were playing LaSalle, knowing that yeah. if we win the game, we're going to play IU in the Mideast Regional. Yeah. And all the fans, mm -hmm. we have great fans and they're smart fans, basically chanting, go Purdue, beat IU. And yeah. the game's not over yet. And um, that's still one of my best memories is, is, is the thrill and, and the goosebumps that I still get today thinking about that process because they kicked us. You don't mind going home and home and winning or losing home and home. What you hate is having your rivalry kick you out of the tournament oh, yeah. at the end of the season. Yeah. The last game you played, and that happened at the NIT when Jerry missed mm -hmm. that wide open yeah. jump shot. <laughs> if, you're, if you're listening, Jerry, which he might be. <laughs> uh, of course, Joe Barry missed the front end of a one-on-one, yeah. -on -one, which oh, would have yeah, put us the game out of reach, yes, right? that is true. Um, but anyways, you hate that. So we weren't going to let that happen. We yeah. got a, a bad summer. The next summer of 1980, we we're going to let IU kick us out of the tournament, and we were determined that I don't know how you the determination. We're, it just wasn't going to happen. We were going to beat them. Yeah. Last question for you. I, I think you played for two couldn't two coaches. You know, you played for actually you played indirectly for four in college, right? Norm Sloan, Fred Schaus, your, your redshirt year, and then uh, and then obviously Lee Rose and Gene Cady. But can you? They were really different guys. I mean, yes. there's no doubt, uh, and uh, both excellent basketball coaches in their own way. But how much different were they, and how big of an adjustment was it for you? Because you were going into your senior year as a captain when Gene Cady comes to Purdue. Mm -hmm. A big adjustment every time you go from a different coach to a different coach, because really you're starting over and everybody's fresh. Yeah. There's no starters. Yeah. You know, it's all new in the co in the, new, in the coach's new eyes. You, you have to fight for your position. So um, maybe it made me a better player, work harder in the off season. But um, Coach Rose was clearly the the statistician. He yeah. was the the technician. X's and O's. We had, yeah. you know, we played full court man to man, full court zone, three quarter court zone, half court zone, half court zone. If the ball was taken to bounds underneath the basket, if it was taken out on the side, yeah. had all these different things that, um, which was good for me because I had a high school coach like that. So yeah. I got to be the, the the captain on the floor to make sure everybody was supposed mm -hmm. to be in the right defenses and stuff like that. When Coach Katie came in our senior year, you know, we lost Joe, we lost the number one draft pick, and, yeah. and you know, we weren't supposed to be and very good. And too. Obviously. And our net and. Um, nobody knew who Russell Cross was or yeah. how good he was going to be, and that was a great filler But um, uh, to replace Joe. But um, Coach Katie was more, you know, your first season at a new place with all these characters, yeah. new players, filling us out, and I'm not sure of the recruits that he brought with him. Um, he was more of a, a supportive coach. He was, you know, he, he would give you – um, try and pump you up, get you excited about the game, et cetera. We, obviously, we had our offenses and defenses, but it wasn't as, as detailed mm -hmm. as what Coach, Coach Rose mm -hmm. was, which for a first-year program is probably the good way to be. Now, as he, as he continued work, uh, living and working here and coaching here, you know, he had Bruce Weber and he had yeah. Coach Stallings yeah. that were with him for a long term that helped with the, the X's and O's and right. things like that. So um, two different personalities, too. Lee Rose was more of a, a quiet, do-it-my-way or, you know, that's it, Coach Rose, do it my way or I'm going to, you know, get in your face. And, I mean, Coach, Coach Katie, Katie yeah. get in your face and let you know you're not doing it my way. Yeah. He might not say anything. He just let you know about Still it. Still do that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, two, two very interesting guys and uh, uh, interesting people to be around, us, to say the least. All right, we're going to let Brian get back to his day job. Uh, but uh, we do appreciate your time with us. And Go all, Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, Purdue, Penn State tomorrow. Brian Newbert will come in segment three, uh, bring us up to date from what uh, he heard from Coach Matt Painter today at availability and uh, give us his take on where the Boilermakers are. And, of course, you can read that uh, uh, times about four or five, six, seven stories on our site uh, as well. We'll take a two-minute break and be back with Brian on Golden Black Live.